Oh, that wraps up talk two uh, for the API security track. And we keep having killer speakers that are just dropping all the knowledge. And um, uh, again, we, we thank all of our sponsors for making this happen. Um, really appreciate that. A few other things to be aware of as we get our next speaker lined up is a few different initiatives. We have the API Sustainability Initiative, um, and we have the Women in APIs program as well. Um, you can find out more about both of these initiatives on apidays.com. Um, I think we have another speaker getting ready to be lined up here. And this speaker is coming in from Datastax. Um, hey, Ash, how's it going, man? How's it going? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Welcome. Awesome. Um, how's your day going? Uh, yeah, really good. I'm in, I'm in New York, so I think I ended up with a pretty lucky part of the time zone lineup here. Oh, for sure. Well, we're really excited to learn about how we can shift our paradigm and thinking about database APIs and, and modernizing um, all of these uh, fun new technologies we have out there to play with. So, Ash, over to you, my friend. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, and I'm really excited to share. So uh, for everyone tuning in or watching later, Thanks so much for making some time uh, to go through this with me today. My name is Ash. Uh, I've recently uh, joined Datastax from Adobe, where I had uh, built and was leading the developer experience team for Creative Cloud. And uh, I've recently joined Datastax as a developer experience architect. Um, something of a shift, but at the same time, uh, my passion and one of the reasons I get out of bed in the morning is to uh, uh, deliver awesome developer experiences. And so. Um, what Datastax has been working on over the last half a year with Stargate has just been really incredible, and I'm excited to share it with you and maybe a little bit about where we're going from here. Um, so title of the talk is Apache Cassandra Now Speaks Developer with Stargate. Um, and the overall sort of theme here is about how we're rethinking database APIs. So you can think of this as something of a, a, a fairly high-level look at um, where we've come from, where we are at the moment and what it means for developers, and then a little bit of where we think we're going from here. Um, and I'm also excited to share that if this kind of thing is of interest to you as an application developer, uh, my colleague uh, Kristen Hunter is going to be giving not one, but two sessions tomorrow, so both a talk and a um, hands-on workshop to uh, give you an idea of what it's like to get in and, and build with these tools. Um, so she's the author of a great book called Irresistible APIs, uh, and I think this will be just a fantastic uh, uh, continuation of some of the topics that we just start to get into today. Um, so hope you'll check out check out both of her sessions tomorrow. So um, we're here to talk APIs, uh, and at the same time, the context uh, that we're going to talk about them in is Cassandra. And so I'm just going to give you just a little bit of an idea of what Cassandra is. Um, Indeed, books and many talks have been written on the subject, and there's a lot of great places to learn about Cassandra. Um, and so I want to just give you enough so you can understand uh, the world in which we're talking about APIs. So uh, bear with me if you know this stuff, but I assume many application developers uh, may not be deeply familiar with Cassandra, and I, I just want to give you this context. So the elevator pitch is not to sell you on Cassandra, but it's literally something that I, uh, it's a title that I stole from a book called Cassandra, The Definitive Guide, which uh, one of my colleagues at Datastax uh, co-authored, uh, Jeff Carpenter. And so I'm actually taking half of his elevator pitch. If you want the rest, I, I guess you can pick up the book. Um, this is already a, a lot of deep words about Cassandra, so here we go. Apache Cassandra is an open source, distributed, decentralized, elastically scalable, highly available, fault tolerant, tunably consistent, row-oriented database. Um, and then that elevator pitch goes on, and then the authors right after that mention that if you ever pitch your boss in an elevator using this elevator pitch, um, you may not get the result that you were hoping for. But I think for a little high-level context setting, this is a fantastic just sort of um, you know uh, explanation of the space that we're working in. Um, application developers, I expect that maybe uh, many of you may see some of this and not you know, have a super deep level of knowledge about it, um, but some of you will, and that's okay. We're really not here to dig into these specifics. Um, but traditionally, Cassandra has been uh, a great fit for these types of workloads. Um, so large deployments, write heavy workloads, geographical distribution, and hybrid cloud and multi-cloud deployment. So um, 
many application developers do have to think about these kind of things often. Um, and the ones that don't, I mean, hopefully, most of the time, we're, we're all hoping we're going to get to a place where we have to worry about them in, in some way or another. And so um, this is where we start to think about, well, what's Cassandra like for the developer? Because if they can start with Cassandra, um, then maybe they can take it all the way uh, uh, to wherever they're going. And so then we step back and think a little bit about what are barriers for application developers? When application developers look at Cassandra as a potential database for the, the, the apps that they're building, um, what is, what's in their way at the beginning? What stops them in some cases? So I'll share um, three different things uh, that um, are relevant in the context of application developers. And you'll notice that the first one's grayed out. And we'll, we'll talk about that just very briefly. So traditionally, uh, one barrier for application developers has been set up an operation for Cassandra. Um, you can certainly do it. It's open source. You can uh, grab it off the shelf and uh, you know uh, go, go through the steps to take care of that stuff. But then again, a lot of times, if you're you're in the mode of developing, you know, stopping to learn how to set something up like this and, uh, you know, uh, get it running. It's not really what you came to do. Now, the, the reason I gray it out is that these days there, there are actually great services that can really just take that, that out of the equation for you if you want. Um, Astra DB from DataStax being one of them um, can really make this uh, instant to set up and uh, a breeze to get started with. But beyond that, once you're actually in the application and you want to uh, talk to the database, well, there are a couple of other barriers that, until recently, um, you know, were high enough that for some application developers, maybe maybe it made it hard for them to get started. And one is needing to learn CQL, which is a bespoke query language for Cassandra. Um, and in addition to that, needing to set up and run uh, drivers for their specific languages, um, and the dri the drivers themselves, again. Um, have uh, a lot of benefited a lot of people over time, and people have gotten tons of mileage out of them. But the reality is that they're often big; um, they are complex to create and maintain, which also slows down a, a little more of the you know future language uh, adoption. And that's not to say that there aren't a lot of uh, drivers for different languages, uh, but um, at the same time, the complexity just makes it difficult to maintain them for the long run. So that's not to disparage these two things. In fact, um, they are um, a part of, uh, they, they continue to be part of where we are today. Um, but at the same time, you know, let's just take a look at even just the developer experience from the code level, uh, uh, one particular driver, um, just to give you an idea of um, some of the things that you might see. Uh, let's say, for example, you're coding um, uh, in, in Node.js and you wanna uh, write a query uh, using the Node.js driver. Now I've hand waved away a lot of uh, things that you might have to do to get this set up and, and that's okay. What I'm really trying to do is give you just this high level impression of, of what it might be like. Uh, in this two liner, you can see from uh, the getting started uh, with the driver is, you know, all right, so first of all, I'm gonna write the query and I'm gonna write it as a string. Um, and that means that I need to learn CQL, which again is something of a barrier for some developers to get started. Um, at the same time, I'm also uh, creating this query as a string, which is going to become ex executable code. And in Node.js or in JavaScript land in general, this is just something that uh, gets our uh, spidey senses tingling just a bit. Um, it's, at bare minimum, it makes it easy for me to make mistakes as a developer, but worse things can happen. Um, so. This is, uh, again, not to knock the Node.js driver in any way. Um, certainly, many people have gotten incredible mileage out of it. But at the same time, we want to focus on um, rethinking the database APIs in a way that brings what we're trying to do a little closer um, to the developer. So I mean, come on, why, why do database APIs matter anyways, right? Like Databases have existed for decades. People have been able to operate and speak to them um, from all sorts of stacks and uh, different setups. And, uh, you know, I mean, can't, aren't we good at this point? And I think, you know, the reason that database APIs matter, or at least one of, one of the most important ones in my mind is that um, application developers matter. And uh, I don't probably have to tell anyone at this conference that the population of application 
um, developers is absolutely exploding. So if we think to, you know, I've seen data that suggests that um, for backend developers, their population may exist in the single digit millions. Whereas with folks that include JavaScript and uh, full stack JavaScript in their skill set, that's already in the double digits of millions. And so that, that population's absolutely exploding and um, we want to be able to serve them well going into the future. Um, these application developers have uh, options and expectations. So since they're such a big um, population, there's plenty of choices out there for them in any given level of the stack to pick a tool. And so we want to make sure that uh, we're able to deliver a great developer experience to them. And that's partly because they influence decision makers. So um, you know, increasingly, we see that uh, developers are more a part of the decision making progress the process, or sometimes the decision makers themselves. And let's not forget that also application developers tend to influence each other out there in the real world, online and in social media. So, you know, if we're not delivering a, a, a great developer experience and meeting their expectations, at best we might be forgotten. At worst, we might be disparaged. And we can we can do way better than that. And um, that's what we've been on the path to for the last half a year or more. So um, developers speak APIs. We all know that. Uh, and now Cassandra can too with Stargate. So um, Stargate was released in December 2020, so a little over half a year ago. It's an open source data gateway that sits between your app and your Cassandra databases. So um, you can see my uh, very simple diagram of this over to the side. Um, chances are for this audience, you could probably imagine this on your own, but in just in case you haven't worked with gateways before, you can see the uh, web developer or the developer uh, application developer down there at the bottom um, and Cassandra database up at the top. And there's a layer, uh, an API gateway sitting in between facilitating communication back and forth. And that's Stargate. So I've seen our uh, product manager for Stargate, uh, Mark Stone, uh, say it like this, that um, these days API gateways are to databases what compilers were to machine language. And so, you know, again, like if you're an application developer, I, I have to assume that you're not spending much time writing machine language. But at the same time, um, when you're talking to your databases, how often do you have to be um, you know, kind of involved in the, the lower details of what's going on in the database that you've chosen, API gateways can eliminate uh, a lot of that uh, barrier. So I'm just gonna show you here, again, high level, very hand wavy um, sample or example of using uh, an endpoint in Stargate to talk to, uh, to, to um, Cassandra. So you can see here that uh, up at the top, I've grayed out some code. It's really just set up, but I wanted just to give you at least a, a little bit of an idea of uh, what else is going on behind the scenes. And there's really not much to it, but I'm using Axios, which is an HTTP client for Node.js. So I, you know, the first line I require it in and the following three lines, I'm setting a base URL and um, setting some uh, default headers. But if I just wanted to use uh, a document API, uh, to get information about my users, then I could just uh, do a make a simple get request. So axios.get, and then I pass in the endpoint. So it's namespaces, key space, collections, and then users is actually the name of uh, a collection that I set up myself. So um, now I'm getting, you know, with this uh, simple get request, I'm getting back information about my users. Again, this is high level, somewhat hand wavy, but it gives you an idea of suddenly, you know, when you're looking at this code as a Node.js developer, this probably feels a lot more familiar than the driver that I showed you did just a moment ago. But we can even go further than that. So let's take a look at um, basically doing the exact same thing with the exact same API, but using an SDK instead. So in this case, we're using the uh, Astra JS collections module from NPM uh, that I've pulled down from NPM. And uh, I pull out this method uh, called create client. I create an instance of the client. And then um, now I'm going to get the information uh, about the users in a very similar way. Namespace, key space, collection, users, right? That's, that's almost uh, pretty much word for word exactly what hitting the endpoint looked like. But now, in addition to being familiar, this is starting to feel very idiomatic to me as a, as a Node.js developer. Um, but the cool thing is, of course, um, you can pick what you want to. And as a matter of fact, you're not even limited to, to just this uh, document API style of interaction. So 
I jumped in immediately just to show you some real ground level examples, um, even though they are high level, they are very specific to Node.js and Document API. But zooming out, that's not all Stargate is. So again, you can see this, this uh, handy little diagram that we have here. Um, and uh, again, the developers at the bottom, Cassandra's up here at the top. We've got Stargate facilitating uh, uh, communication between us back and forth. So um, these APIs uh, are each in and of themselves um, different modes of communication that I can select based on my needs as a developer. So if we rip the sticker off of the top here, you can see that this is what we have today. We've got REST, Document API, GraphQL support, and even an interface for um, writing CQL queries. So um, that, again, we just talked a moment ago when I was showing you, you know, just hitting the endpoints that um, we, we selected the document API. We could have done REST, we could have done GraphQL. That was really just up to me um, as the application developer. And of course, now that we have APIs, it also means that we can have some lightweight SDKs on top. And uh, in fact, we have a handful of them today uh, and I showed you just a, a, a small example of using the Node uh, SDK that we have uh, for using the Document API. Um, and again, so for me, that second path there was kind of following through Node to Document to Cassandra and back. Um, but we also have SDKs for Java and Python. So um, this really offers a ton of flexibility, a ton of flexibility, but also um, what we believe is really important is that familiarity and where we can, you know, that idiomatic approach to um, letting developers work, giving them the freedom to be more expressive in their own environments, and developers are loving it so far. Um, I won't read this whole quote here, but this is from, um, from Vinay Chela at Netflix. Um, just zeroing in on the bold piece of this, um, it states that. Stargate in Cassandra will break API boundaries, data silos, and ultimately help unify all developers to work better together. And that's that's really the the vision here is uh, exactly that. So it's great that um, uh, you know Vinay at Netflix has picked up on that and is already getting uh, great value out of it. And uh, same for uh, Sharisha Vantero at Yelp. And again, just to note here the bold aspect of this quote. The ability to abstract Cassandra specific concepts entirely from app developers and support different API options will go a long way in removing barriers of entry for new software developers at Yelp. Um, so that's a, that's a really awesome aspect of it, right? And if you think back to that diagram, once again, it's um, putting a layer or a, a layer in the SDK layer, if you will, in between so that the developers, again, are able to communicate um, in the way that they most see fit in the way that's most comfortable to them. Uh, back and forth with Cassandra. Um, and so uh, this is just a really exciting uh, moment where, again, we're a little over six months into it. Uh, and, you know, most of what happened uh, with Stargate uh, started uh, before I joined the company, but we get to work with a really awesome team of uh, product folks and uh, engineers at um, data stacks that are building this out. So. Six months in, as you can imagine, um, you know, six months in from the V1 release, we we have um, plenty of other things on our mind that we're working on at the moment, or things that we're looking into, and I've just kind of picked a small handful of um, aspects of uh, you know what we're looking into going forward. Uh, and you can see here that uh, item number one is gRPC support. Um, so that's a whole universe <laughs> that we could uh, get into another time. Um, but it's something that we're really starting to dig into um, and uh, are excited because, uh, among other things, it's going to offer improved network performance, which is huge. Um, it communicates over HTTP2, um, and so uh, gives us uh, some benefits there. Um, and it's also going to make it easier for us to expand language support. So I had mentioned with, uh, with classic drivers for Cassandra, um, they're more involved meaning that it's, uh, you know, really just depends on, um, in some cases, uh, you know, just that level of complexity and who's able to take on the work of either creating a new language uh, uh, or a new plugin that supports a new language. Um, whereas we believe with gRPC, that's going to make this process a lot more streamlined. And so far, that seems to be the case. 
Next up is uh, API iterations. So this one almost goes without saying, but um, it's it's worth calling out that you know the things that we've uh, already got out there, we want to keep making them better. Um, and we've got uh, further in enhancements for GraphQL on the way very soon. Uh, but we'll also be working on uh, further adherence to standards uh, with uh, some of the APIs we've already got out there. And next up is contributor experience, uh, which is something that I think I've been hearing our product manager talk a lot more about uh, recently, and um, I think sometimes can go overlooked. And so I'm glad that we're talking about this. Um, and this is, you know, in other words, if if you as a developer, you know, thus far in this talk, we've been talking about application developers. But what about folks that want to come in and work on the open source project alongside us? Um, well, let's make sure that experience is great too. And so one step there is to um, look into you know, moving to more of a microservice-based architecture, um, which can make it more approachable for uh, new developers to show up to the project. And in addition to that, of course, uh, improved build and run experience from the get-go. So those are things that we're looking into. Um, and I'll share in a moment how um, you know, where you can go check out the open source project and, and get involved and, and all that kind of stuff. But would love to uh, hear from you if uh, some of the stuff has started to pique your interest. So um, just to wrap things up, uh, if, you, uh, if you're interested uh, uh, and you want to learn more, go check out uh, stargate.io. That's the top level page for Stargate. You can learn all kinds of cool stuff there. And it's got links back to the repo and everything else that you would want to see. But just in case you want to take a shortcut to GitHub, uh, we've got github.com slash Stargate, where you can go check out all the repos we've got under that organization. And lastly, if you want to try it out, uh, head over to astra.datastacks.com, uh, um, where AstraDB makes it just super simple to set up a database really quickly. And it's going to give you all of these APIs for you to uh, interact with um, and play around with. So I think that's the fastest and simplest way as an application developer to try out this API first approach to communicating with Cassandra uh, through Stargate APIs. So. Um, if you want to reach out, I'm Ash Ryan on LinkedIn, Ash Ryan underscore IO on Twitter, and Ash Ryan dot IO on Instagram. Um, Cassandra speaks developer with Stargate. Uh, we can't wait for you to try it out and maybe even get involved. And right here at the end, I'll just call out again that tomorrow we've got some great hands on sessions that dig into more of the application, the building the application side of things with Kirsten Hunter. Uh, we'd love for you to join that and give it a try. Thanks so much, everyone, for your time. Ash, that was great. Um, that's a new space for me, and there's so many uh, just killer new technologies out there, and Datastack sounds like a great project to get involved in and, and seems really promising. A um, few questions just out there. Um, you know, if you, if you could speak to a developer, architect, or engineering, or platform manager that has some projects on the horizon for H2 that they're looking to tackle, what would be some great potential use cases or things for them to keep in mind and potentially leverage, you know, this new technology for it. Yeah. I mean, I think the one thing is, you know, just again, the fact that this is going to make it so simple for uh, the developers to, um, to get up and running. So, I mean, you saw that one of the quotes, I think it was from Yelp, one of the quotes about like onboarding new developers into uh, your own uh, uh, projects internally. Um, when people can show up and, you know, if they're bringing their own GraphQL skills or whatever else uh, with them, then you've already um, saved yourself tons of time in terms of, um, you know, uh, getting getting those developers spun up and communicating with Cassandra. So I think that that's just, I mean, that's that's meant to be the core benefit here is providing that, that API gateway that just lets developers show up and um, makes it super easy for them to get involved. Um, probably another aspect, though, again, is the open source nature of the gateway itself. It means that you can dig in and be a part of the, uh, you be one of the contributors and, and part of um, uh, the direction that it goes in. So um, hopefully the people, we're hoping that people will find that appealing as well. Yeah, great. Well, Ash, thank you so much for the, the thoughtful talk. Um, best of luck and uh, appreciate you guys supporting the API Days Conference. James Tyler. Bye.